All right, so we're going to talk about him, and this will be my last one, in Yahweh Zabayot, right? The Lord of armies, God of armies. And we were doing last week, we were looking at the jealousy of the Lion of Judah. And we're going to finish that today, okay? And look at the things that are coming. We heard about it in communion and some beautiful psalms. And of course, they were about the times that we're living in, the coming of the Messiah for his people Israel. But does the Lord frustrate... Does he nullify the plans of the nations and the wicked and all those who are scheming right now? Will they come to nothing? Do you believe that? Because when we see the news, it doesn't seem that way, does it? When we hear all the stuff going on in the world, we can, as we've been saying, don't let your heart be troubled. Jesus said these things must take place. So we're going to see, mainly today, I want to focus on that time period of the Lord of armies coming. We've already gone through many scriptures setting this up. Many weeks ago, we went to Revelation 19, and we looked at him coming, uh, even as it says in Isaiah, is he a mighty man of war, yeah. okay? And he is coming with a two-edged sword, amen? Yeah. Okay, and he is going to cut down his foes. So we are going to start today in Zechariah chapter 14, all right? So if you want to turn to me there. And I've got a bunch of scriptures today I just want to go through and, again, get our time frame, get our hope fixed on the Messiah, because as we go through all this stuff, right, these are the scriptures that are going to encourage us. Yes, there's hard stuff. Yes, there's the day of the Lord that must come, but there is a coming kingdom. We're told to pray by our Messiah, your kingdom and your will be where? On earth as it is in heaven. Right? There's an error in the church, and there's truth in it, but everyone's talking about heaven. And I'm all for heaven, amen? But who was the earth created for? Point at yourself. Okay? It was created for God, but it was created for us. What did he do with the man? He created the earth, he created the man, and he put the man where? In the garden to cultivate it and to keep it. So heaven is God's throne, right? His home, but where does he long to be? He longs to be here with us on earth. He longs for the new heaven and the new earth, right, where in righteousness dwells. So we need to have a correct view on these things. So in Zechariah 14, we're just going to start reading. Behold, a day is coming for the day when the spoils taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem. So what day, what time period are we talking about? The day of the Lord, very good. The end of the age, the end of Daniel's 70th week. Jacob's trouble, all the different things we can call it, right? Against Jerusalem for battle. So how does this all come to a, a culmination? All the nations will gather together where? In Israel. And who are they coming against? Jerusalem, okay? The city of God. Now, again, we know the Lord is bringing them, and there's that demonic cry, right? And the enemy himself who wants to wipe out the Jews, destroy God's city, take over God's city. But there's also another side of this. The nations, do you know several of them will be coming against the Antichrist? That's very clear what it says in Daniel, okay? It says that the Antichrist hears rumors from the north and from the east, and they scare him. So that means the nations aren't all in league with the Antichrist. So do you know they're gathering to fight against him too, and the Lord will use that? Isn't that awesome? That, that should actually encourage us, because then it shows us, we look at the enemy's plan, we look at man's plan, and it's like, they're all going to get together, and there's nobody who can stop them. No, even in the day of the Lord, they're not united. The Lord's using them, all of that, just like we're seeing now. All the politics, you hear China saying this, Russia saying this, America saying this, and supposedly, right, everyone's supposed to be on the same page, and we're welcoming in the 2030 agenda, and we're going to get rid of, and everyone's fighting, aren't they? They all say they are for the same goals, yet they all fight with each other. Anyway, God frustrates. We heard it this morning. He will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be taken, the house is plundered, and the women raped. Now, these are hard scriptures, and Jesus reiterated this in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse. And half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be eliminated from the city. Now, I'm not going to go into all the, the time frame here. If there's great stuff, I want to get the heart of it. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. So what is he going to do? He's going to fight against the nations. As when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west, forming a very large valley. Half the mountain will move towards the north, the other half towards the south. Now this is also prophesied about in Revelation, that there was a great earthquake and uh 
there is much interpretation to that. We'll just read here, and it says, And you will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azazel, Azel, and yes, you will flee just as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. So does God intend us to know history? So are, is the earthquake recorded in the kingdom period as in the days of Uzziah and even in Isaiah and other prophets as it was in the, the year that King Uzziah died, right? So we have reference here that we're supposed to know the history on. Then the Lord my God, all right, so really quick, if you want to interpret God, what do you need to know? The word of God, all right? It is the, the syllabus, okay? It is the codex, however you want to phrase it. It's the interpretation to prophecy. So if you don't know the word of God, and this is the problem we have now with all these modern day prophets coming and wanting to interpret the book of Revelation, they don't know the prophets. They actually have a doctrine that says God's done away with the Old Testament and done away with all that stuff. And then they try to interpret the book of Revelation. How's that going to work? All the heresies, all the things we have now, and hence why Jesus isn't coming back to Jerusalem, we're all going to heaven. And they base it on John 14, which is true. He's going to prepare a place for us, but do we stay there? No, we don't stay there because is our king coming to rule and reign from down here? And are we his bride? And wherever he goes, where are we going to go? We're going to go with the bridegroom, okay? So he's coming to Jerusalem, we know, for a thousand years to rule and reign. He continues on. He says, Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. On that day there will be no light. The luminaries will die out. Many places it phrases it like this. Uh, Jesus also talks about this in Matthew 24. This is the culmination of the day of the Lord. For it will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, Jesus reiterating this in Matthew 24, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at the time of evening there will be light. light. All right, so... Can anyone interpret what the light will be? Yeah, the Lord coming into the city because it is a day of gloom and darkness. And up until when the Lord comes, is it going to look like? We, we read uh, Zechariah chapter 12 last week and they have to mourn, right? They have to go through the process, process excuse me, of accepting the Messiah. And before that, who's going to be in the city? Who's going to pitch his tent, his dwelling in the city? The Antichrist, Satan himself at the end of the day. So how's that going to look to those who are in the city or even those who have escaped from the city? It's going to look like this is it. The plot of the evil one, man, however you want to phrase it, for the last, we'll say 4,000 years to try to wipe the Jewish people off the face of the earth. The Jews going to say it's going to come to pass. But then they will see a bright light. The Messiah will come. I think there could be interpretation in this as well. Do we know the sign of the Son of Man will appear? Okay, so again, we look at Matthew 24, and we need to go back to the prophets and realize the Lord has already told us this stuff. Jesus just told us in greater detail, and he was building on what was already revealed by the prophets. And on that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea, other half towards the western sea. Come to Bible school if we want to discuss all these things. <laughs> it will be in summer as well as in winter. God will be king over all. What should you all say? Yeah, come on. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be the only one. And his name, the only one. That's an awesome verse. And all the land will change into a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and will remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place of the first gate and the corner gate from the tower of Hananel. Now, I have a scripture in Psalms we're going to talk about in a minute on this. To the king's wine presses, people will live in it and they will no longer be a curse for Jerusalem will live in security. Now, we know at the end of the age what is going to be the lie propagated by the Antichrist and the world, peace and security. So the reality is we are going to see a false peace and security, and it's going to look like Jerusalem is doing well. Do you guys know that, right? We kind of have this picture like Jerusalem's always going to have issues, and, and they will, of course, until the Lord comes. But there will be a fleeting moment in there where they will have worship on the Temple Mount where they will not have constant warfare. They will have a covenant and a treaty that the nations will actually abide by for time, times, and half a time. And in that time, it will look good. And this is where we actually need to make sure our diplomacy is a heavenly diplomacy. 
Because if we see that and we go, diplomacy, it's working. The kings are at peace with Israel. Oh, Palestine, and they're all getting along. Could we be duped? And do you know there's going to be lots of Christians that are duped then? That actually think this is what the prophets were talking about. By no means. Because the only time that truly comes is when the prince of peace is in the city. Only when he comes is there that true security. Jerusalem will no longer be under a curse. So the reality is in that three and a half years peace and safety, will there be a great curse on Jerusalem? And is that a hard thing to say? And does God love his city? Come on, is it the apple of his eye? We're going to read that in a minute. His cornea is fixed there. He loves that place. It is where he has chosen to put his name forever. But is there a curse on it? And when we think about Jerusalem, do you think it's cursed? We wouldn't phrase it that way, would we? But did the Lord phrase it that way? Because a curse has come upon the city because they are not operating as the city they are intended to be. It is intended to be, I'll say. All right, we're going to read something on the minute, so just bear with me. So it continues on in Zechariah 14. Now this will be the plague which the Lord God will strike the peoples who have gone to war against Jerusalem. All right, so everyone ready for it? Now I hope I've set you up long enough. This is what, part seven? Have we talked about the Lord of armies? Have we talked about who he is? So if you haven't gotten it by now, <laughs> then you need, yeah, maybe you don't want it. Or you need to go to the Lord and you need to allow him to write it on your heart and your mind. Because these next verses, just like we read about in the day of the Lord, in the tribulation period, it says that the armies of the enemy are going to come in and they're going to pillage. They're going to rape. They're going to do horrible things in the city. And is that, are those hard things to read? But the problem is, why are there people in the city? Okay, Jesus said they were to flee. He warned them about this time period. And does it show the hardness of their heart? Why are there people that won't be raptured? Why are there people that aren't Christians? Do we have to face these things, guys? Mankind is hard. Mankind, Jesus said, you being evil. We're evil, guys. All of you are evil. <laughs> Apart from God. And do we all need to not forget that? And we could become a bit naive as Christians when we become part of his family. We're like, yay, we're part of his family. But we forget and it's not that we dwell on it. We don't speak of the things that are done in secret, the evil that they do. But can we very easily overlook it and not think it's as bad as it actually is? And have we noticed in the last couple of years, is it, is it worse than we could have ever anticipated? All right. When Jesus said it would be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot, I'll be honest. I don't think any of us really understood that until we started to live it. Okay? Because we in the West especially have been, been protected by God. Yeah, amen. We, we've actually had a spoiling because have we embraced God? Okay, it doesn't mean everyone was saved, but was there an embracing in the government? Was there an embracing of God's law in our society? And with that, the scriptures are very clear. Does a blessing come? Yeah. Well, now a curse has come, and we're seeing the, the results of that. So the Lord of armies, this is what will happen to those who go to war. Against Jerusalem, their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets. Their tongue will rot in their mouth. Are you okay with that, Lord of Armies? This is the culmination, guys. We have to get the picture. God, could he have done this at any point? Anytime. anytime, he's God. But this is after the Great Tribulation. This is at the later time period because Jesus is coming over the Mount of Olives. He is coming to his holy city. He is coming as a man of war from the wilderness. Awesome stuff there. And as he comes over, are there going to be men and women who fight against him? And think they will defeat him. And wholeheartedly know who he is. All right? We have to take that full picture as it is. Because it says, remember in Revelation, all the plagues came upon the people. And they cursed the God of heaven. And they knew it was him who had authority and power over the plagues. That's the culmination of it. All right? So this is the reality of man's heart not submitted to God. So this is why he must bring it so severe. It will come about on that day that a great panic from the Lord will fall on them, and they will seize one another's hand, and the hand of one will be raised against the hand of the other. So we know Jesus is going to come, and he's going to judge them, but are they going to turn on each other? All right, is Magog, right? Russia going to be coming down. There are the armies from the east. China going to be coming over. All Tubal and Cain and all the other ones. And Rome, are they all going to be gathering? And are they going to, yeah, turn on each other? Have we seen this in the scriptures before, guys? 
Come on, have we seen the armies of each other turn and they start to cut one another and they start to go against one another instead of fulfilling their goal? It then continues on and it says, Judah also will fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be gathered. Gold, silver, garments in, abund in great abundance. Now again, I think there's a bit of a cryptic thing here in a sense. Judah will also fight at Jerusalem. Well, who's the lion of Judah? Okay, yeah. So is this talking about Jesus coming and fighting? And then could there be something where we actually have some uh, Judeans coming and fighting? Okay, with the Lord. Joshua, we have to get that picture in our head. Did Joshua lead them into the promised land? What is the Messiah going to do? He's the Joshua, Yeshua. And is he going to lead them over the Mount of Olives and they're going to come into the promised land? And are they going to vanquish their enemies? Right? We have a tendency to make it all spiritual, which is good. But is it also natural? Is there an actual natural battle going on? And are there Jews caught in the midst of the battle? And will there be ones in the wilderness who swear allegiance to Yahweh, come over the hill, and they will vanquish their enemies, following behind the Yeshua? As Joshua back in uh, Torah, right, he brought them in, but did they vanquish all their enemies? No, because they went into idolatry and they, their hearts were not fully for the Lord. Well, this generation will not be like that because it says the Lord will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication upon them. They will come into the new covenant and the Lord will he change their heart of stone into a heart of flesh. All right, is this awesome stuff, guys? See, we've received a precursor, but we got to remember this is the hope for the future. So all the things, right, from the nations will be given unto Israel. And just like this plague, there will be a plague on the horse, on the mule, on the camel, on the donkey, and all the cattle that will be in those camps. So we have to remember, sin does not just affect people. Sin affects everything. Creation is affected by sin. Animals are affected by sin. And we have to go back to Leviticus to get this picture. I, the Lord, am holy. And you shall be holy as I am holy. So what does the Lord have to cleanse from the earth? Yeah, sin, anything that is unholy, anything that is unclean. We're going to get to that in Bible school in Ezekiel. There's some great verses on that. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations. So will there be nations left? Yeah, okay, very clear. That came against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of armies. See, we have this picture of the millennial reign, and, and in God's he's really working on me in it. And we kind of think it's like it's the time of perfect peace, and there's no issues. Now that's coming in, and it's leading up to the eighth day. But do you know there's still some issues in the millennial reign? Not with Jesus, not with Israel, not with his holy city, Jerusalem. But guess where the, the problems can arise? In the nations, that's right. And these nations are one whom the Lord allows to come in. And we're going to see why in a minute. And as he allows them to come in, they've been defeated by the Lord of armies. And when you've been defeated by somebody, if you don't submit your whole heart to that kingdom, what will happen? Resentment. Very good. Unforgiveness. Bitterness. You, okay, think about Gog Magog, that whole thing, right? God of Magog. And then in the time period when Satan is released, is it the same people's? that he stirs up with others as well, and they come down, and they come against Jerusalem yep. again. So all that thousand years, of course, there's going to be many, I believe, that will be loyal to the Lord, but there will also be many. What's in their heart? He took it from us. This is supposed to be our inheritance, right? Okay, I know we're dealing with this now in wars that are going on. Why is Russia doing all they're doing? The Lord is, of course, stirring them up, but what is the, the heart behind it? That's our territory. And those Westerners came in, and they told us we must dissolve the Soviet Union and break down the wall, but that is ours, and we're going to take it back. So what's going to be the heart cry at the end of the millennial reign in those territories? It's going to be the same. That's right. And the scary thing about it, and that's why it's the culmination. It's the end of end. Because right now, very, very clearly, our principalities and the enemy himself, is he dictating a lot of the stuff behind the scenes? And people then go along with it, willingly, by the way. They have free will and choice. But the removal of the enemy, the judgment of principalities, Jesus re ruling and reigning in Jerusalem, when that battle comes apart, uh, uh, sorry, comes, uh, uh, tongue-tied, when it comes to pass, the reality is Satan was he held for a thousand years. And when he's released, 
It's really what? It's to show what's in their hearts. Now, God already sees it all. That's what I find amazing. And could he just be like, this is my eternal kingdom? No. And just vaporize that person. Come on, could he do that? He's Jesus. He's God. But he doesn't. He gives that generation a thousand years. You talk about grace, right? We get stuck in grace when we think about Jesus. But grace is God's kingdom. It's all the way from the beginning. Eight of the fruit of the tree, grace. <laughs> we, yeah, it's physical death entered, but we didn't eternally die. The Lord gave us grace, and did he kill the first animal? And did he make covering, and did he make atonement for their sin? And then the next story we get is Cain and Abel, and did the Lord teach them how they could draw near to God? Amen. Grace, his mercy, his loving kindness. Oh, man, I'm only on Zechariah 14. Let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't believe me? Thanks. Hey, this is part seven. I got to end, right? Uh, it will come about, those who are left, right? They will go up year to year to worship the king, the Lord of armies, and to celebrate the feast of booths. Amen. Sukkot. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship. So what does that scripture imply? That, yeah, disobedience, rebellion, they shall be reluctant. And why does he have to rule with an iron scepter? Why does it say here? It could it have said, uh, from year to year, they will go up and worship the king, the Lord of peace. Could it have said that? Why does it say the Lord of armies here? Because they must come under his subjection. They must say he is the one who rightfully rules and reigns over this planet because he created it. He is sovereign. He is Lord. And he has defeated all his enemies. And I must come in subjection underneath him. Now, the beautiful thing is, can we receive that now? And as we receive that now, we will be uh, counted as part of his kingdom and we will have a great reward. And it will be whichever family or don't go up, right, to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of armies... There will be no rain on them. A curse will come upon them. And if the families of Egypt don't go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague which the Lord strikes the nations. Does that say plural? Nations, okay, that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. This will be the punishment for Egypt, the punishment for, of all the nations that, does, uh, that do not go up, excuse me, to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Now, I believe the Feast of Booths is going to take on a whole new interpretation in the millennial reign because it is the day of his coronation, if you want to say. It is his day of tabernacling amongst us. So it's no longer, it's, it's awesome in what it means, but it's going to take on a whole new meaning for those nations. That if they don't come up on the Feast of Booths, what are they saying? We, eject, we reject your kingship. We reject your authority here on this earth. And the cooking pots. Now, this is awesome. Actually, back it up. On the day which will be inscribed in the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord. On the cooking pots in the Lord's house. So what will be in the Lord's house? Cooking pots. What were the cooking pots used for? Sacrifice. <laughs> will be like the bowls before the altar. Every cooking pot in Jerusalem, in Judah, Judah, excuse me, will be holy to the Lord of armies. And all who sacrifice, when is this time period? Millennial. The millennial reign. I'm working on a teaching for that, so you got to bear with me. Will come and take them and boil in them, and there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of armies on that day. And this is about purging the land. Israel will be holy to the Lord, even the horses, even the bowls. What will everything be? Holy to the Lord. And no unclean thing will be allowed in that place. And is that going to be an awesome day? Because that's what Israel was intended to be from its foundation, guys. All right, and we're going to read about that. So in Psalm 59, we just read Zechariah 14, and we saw, remember, it talked about the gates, the Benjamin gate and the different gates and the kings and the blah, 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 right? What is the point of all of that? Psalm 59 explains it very clearly. Rescue me from my enemies, my God. Set me securely on high, away from those who rise up against me. Rescue me from those who practice injustice. And save me from men of bloodshed. For behold, they have set an ambush for my life. Fierce men attack me, not for my wrongdoing nor my sin. Lord, for no guilt of mine, they run and take their stand against me. Stir yourself to help me and see... You, Lord God of armies, the God of Israel, awake to punish, what does he say? The nations. Now, we have a tendency to read the Psalms, and what do we always think? Well, this is just David going through a hard time. 
Do you, I, I, I've gotten to the point where I can't go through a psalm without finding something about the millennial reign, the messianic kingdom, whether it be his first coming, his second coming, however you want to phrase that, or the eternal age that is to come. They're in every single psalm because what are they? They're prophetic worship songs, okay, in our modern day, we'll say phrasing. They're worship songs unto God, but Asa specifically, or SF, right? You go through, and every single one of them is about the, the kingdom to come. It's about the millennial reign. It's about the reigning of Jesus. So it says here, he will punish all the nations. Do not be gracious to any of those who do treacherously in wrongdoing. Selah, they return at evening. Are we okay singing worship songs like this? They return at evening. They howl like a dog and prowl around the city. Behold, they gush forth with their mouth. Swords are in their lips, for they say, who hears? Yep. But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You scoff at all the nations. Very similar to what we heard during the communion, right? Behold, uh, because of his strength, I will watch for you. For, the, for God is my refuge. Amen. My God is in his faithfulness will meet me. God will let me look triumphantly upon my enemies. Do not kill them or my people will forget. Scatter them by your power. Bring them down, Lord, our shield, on account of the sin of their mouths and the words of their lips. May they even be caught in their pride. And on account of their curses and lies which they tell, destroy them in wrath, destroy them so that they will no longer exist, so that the people may know that God rules in where? In Jacob to the ends of the earth. So is this psalm just about David's enemies being defeated? No, this is talking about the day of the Lord ultimately. This is talking about the judgment that's to come at the end of the age. And what's the point? So that the people, or we could say the goyim, the nations, may know that God rules where? In Jacob and to the ends of the earth. So from Jacob, from Jerusalem, from Judah, what will go forth to the whole world? Yeah, knowledge, right? His kingship, his authority. And the nations will know Israel is the nation in which the king dwells. Selah, they return at evening and howl like a dog and prowl around the city. They wander about for food and murmur if they are not satisfied. But as for me, I will sing of your strength. So guys, they prowl around, they murmur, they do all that stuff. But as for me, what are we going to do? I will sing of your strength. Yes, I will joyfully sing of your faithfulness in the morning. When you get up in the morning, are you doing that? <laughs> no, okay, we got one honest person. <laughs> Right? You get up in the morning and uh, work. You hear the news, gas prices. <laughs> right? You hear about war. You hear about destruction. You hear about bombs and threats and then politicians voting this and doing that. Where the reality is, what's the first thing we need to do? We need to sing to the Lord. Right? Sing your faithfulness in the morning, for you have been a refuge and a place of refuge on the day of my distress. My strength, I will sing praises to you, for God is my refuge and uh, the God who shows me favor. So if you want that refuge, if you want that strength, what do you need to do? Worship him. That was, the, see, the temple, it went off, but the original founding of the temple, do you know, remember David appointed minstrels? And we say 24-hour worship, right? And there was lots of people that tried to model things off that. But the point was that in that place, what was constantly ascending up? Worship. The praises of God. And then if you went inside uh, the room, yeah, you had the incense, didn't you? And the incense was the prayers of the people, the worship of the people, continually going up before God. And do we need to stay in that place? And do we need to fight for it? And when we feel that moaning, that murmuring, the things of the world on us, sing a song to the Lord. All right? It can be a worship song you know. That's fine. But it says sing a new song. So what's that mean? Sing a new song. Sing what's in your heart. Sing of the testimony of your life. Sing of the things God has done for you. Not for somebody else. For you. Because is he a personal God? Is he near to us? So, Lord Jesus, thank you for, and then you praise him, you worship him. And, by the way, that's not about having a good voice. <laughs> All right? Some of you, I'm not musical. That's not what it's about, okay? It's about a relationship with your creator. It's about worship unto him, and you overflow out of that place, and it will bless him and you. All right, so as the Lord, we heard he's going to gather them all together. We heard about the judgment that's going to come. Well, what's going to happen next? I had a picture of the sheep and the goats there. We're going to get there in a second. But before we get to that, let's read Joel, or Yoel, chapter 3. And the Lord tells us, after 
this war, after this battle, we call it the Armageddon campaign, right? He will gather them to the plain of Megiddo, uh, and all the armies will come against Jerusalem. But he tells us what he will do with them. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Yahashaphat. All right, everyone remember King? We say Jehoshaphat, but Yahashaphat, right? Everyone remember him? All right, and was he a righteous king? He was, and he, he did many great things for the Lord. But he was commemorated in this valley, and in that valley there's lots of history. We won't do a whole discourse on it now. But the Lord will bring him in. Does anyone know what Yahashaphat means? Yeah, the righteous judge of all the earth, we could say. His name meant the judge, Yahweh, God the judge, okay? So as they come, where are they going to come into? The valley of judgment. judgment, that's right, or in the valley of decision, okay? Then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel. So how is he going to enter into judgment with them? On how they've treated Israel. Now we can say there's a bit of truth in this. Do we come from Israel? Come on. We are not Israelis, okay? Don't go out of here thinking something weird, all right? <laughs> but we come from them, absolutely. It's the rich root. And do we trace our roots back to Abraham? And as the stars in the heavens and all of that, right, so shall be your descendants. So we can be included in this as well. But really, what's it about? It's how they've treated Israel, the people. Yes, the inheritance that came after them. But also, have they treated his land? Have they Because this is God's land, guys. We have to remember that. Now, it's his earth, but he has chosen to put his name in Israel forever. Whom they have scattered among the nations. Did they do that? Yep. And they have divided up my land. Have they done that? Yep. They have also cast lots for my people. Yep. Traded a boy for a harlot, sold a girl for wine that they may drink. If you know anything about the Hebrews' history, you know this has all come to pass ever since their foundation. Okay? Moreover... What are you to me, O Tyre, Sidon, and all the regions of Philistia? You are rendering me recompense. But if you do recompense me swiftly and speedily, I will return recompense on your head. So he is going to judge these territories. Now, there's all history, of course, how they've treated Israel specifically in these lands. Since you have taken my silver, my gold, brought my precious treasures to your temples, and they've done this many times throughout the decades, and sold the sons of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks... Uh, your Bible might say Yavin there. Yavin is the father of the Greeks. In order to remove far, uh, them far from their territory, behold, I am going to arouse them from the place where you have sold them and return your recompense on your head. Is that a scary word? The things that you have done to my people, I'm going to do to you. That's scary, okay? Also, I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the sons of Judah. They will sell them to the Sabines, to a distant nation. For the Lord has spoken. If the Lord says he's spoken, is there any if, and, or but? No. Okay, if I say to my son, dad says, and he says, no, no, dad has spoken. Yeah, the foot is down. Don't even mess with that. Don't even say anything else. This is the way it is, okay? How much more so with our heavenly father? He has spoken, right? He then continues on, proclaim this among the nations. So what are we supposed to do? Come on, am I doing what the scriptures have actually told us to do? We are to proclaim this until it comes to pass. So prophecy is to be proclaimed, guys. It's not supposed to be hidden away and, you know, we're, oh, look, that's cool, but I'm not going to tell anybody. Because when you say it, let's be honest, what are people going to do? Yes or no. <laughs> yeah, yes or no. And then if they say no, what are they going to They're going to mock. They're going to scoff. They're maybe even going to persecute you. And they're going to come against you. But will the word of the Lord endure? Will it stand forever? Amen. And so our job is to speak it out. How can they hear? How can they repent? How can they turn if there's not a preacher? If there's not someone crying it out, right? So then it continues on. Proclaim it among the nations. And what's he want us to proclaim? Prepare a war. Rouse the mighty men. Let all the soldiers draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Now in Isaiah, we get the complete opposite. That we get the time period of when the, the implements of weapon will be turned into implements for farming, right? For, for blessing. Let the weak say, I am a mighty man. Hasten and come, all the surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down, O Lord, your mighty ones. Let the nations be aroused and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there... I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. 
He continues on. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Now, when Jesus tells us parables about the harvest, are we supposed to know these scriptures? In the book of Revelation, we get an angel coming and putting a sickle. Are we supposed to know these things? We can't interpret them correctly if we don't know the time frame. So when does this all happen? This is at the end of the day of the Lord. So right now, there's lots of Bible prophecy. Like, uh, uh, God bless them. Pat Robert, Robertson, excuse me, 700 Club. He came out of retirement. He's in his 80s now to make a proclamation. And he went on to say about Russia, Gog Magog, and he made some wild accusations, I'll say about how, oh, it's coming down, and this is going to come to pass. And there's truth in it. He sees something there because he knows Bible prophecy. But the problem is he's wrong in his timing. Why? Because all of this very clearly, when is it? Yeah, it's at the very end of the day of the Lord. It does not happen before that. You read through the text, and you get the markers where it says the luminaries will dindle. All the nations will come. This will happen. This will happen. Are we seeing those things? No. So is God stirring up Russia right now? Yes. Preparing, that's right. Setting the stage. But is it that time period yet? No, because has there been a great earthquake in Jerusalem that has split the city open? I think we might know about that. Okay? So that has not happened yet. So God is so kind. He puts these things as time pieces. And that's why Paul says, right, if a spirit or a letter or another word comes, he talks about the Second Thessalonians chapter 2, that the day of the Lord has, yeah, it's already taken place. Don't listen to it. Don't get upset. And that's why Jesus said, see to it, you are not frightened. See to it that you're not disturbed or shaken from, uh, in the, uh, excuse me, in Second Thessalonians there, Paul says, uh, my translation, the ASV says, in your composure. But in the Greek, it actually says in your mind. Yes. That word there is in the Greek mind, which I think is a great inter interpretation there and really gets it across. Because where does the enemy want to get in? Remember what the helmet is? The helmet of salvation, or we could say deliverance. It's on your mind. The king is coming. His kingdom is coming. This age is passing away. So where does the enemy want to attack you? Yeah, he wants you to believe all millennialism or preterism. He wants you to start to say the day of the Lord already happened. Oh, the book of Revelation is allegorical. And stop believing and not, not be looking for the coming of the king. So put the sickle to the harvest, right? It is ripe. Come, tread, for the wine press is full, the vats overflow. And this is similar to many other prophecies. For their wickedness is great. Multitude, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon grow dark. So again, we get the time period here. Same in Zechariah 14. Same in Matthew 24. These are always the culminations of the day of the Lord. The sun and the moon grow dark. The stars lose their brightness. The Lord roars from where? Zion. And he utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth, they tremble. Now we know, of course, he is going to roar from the earthly one. But is there also a heavenly one he will roar from? All right? But the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold for the sons of Israel. We've heard several psalms on that today. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion. Everyone say, my holy mountain. My Come on, amen. So Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will pass through it no more. Judah will be blessed, and in that day the mountains will drip with sweet wine. What did we read in Zechariah 14? Jerusalem is under a curse right now. And will that curse majorly come upon it when they accept the treaty and the man of lawlessness and all that will happen, right? But this is the hope. Will it operate then in the true blessing God has called it to? And that day will come. And we in the church have to be careful because I've seen this. People are saying Jerusalem is operating in that blessing now. There's a blessing that's come upon them as they've come into the land. Is that true? Because they're fulfilling Bible prophecy. But they are not operating in this blessing. So when people say, oh, they're, they're, their goods are going out to the nations. Oh, look at all the innovations. Look at all the technology. That's awesome because God has made them that way. They have a blessing on them regardless. That's why the nations hate them. <laughs> That's why you have all the stereotypes. The Jews, oh, they're the jewelers. Oh, the Jew, Jews, they can work with all the gold. Oh, look how smart they are. And they don't even need to try. And what do the nations do? They get jealous of them. And who said, the, who said that would happen? The Lord. The Lord said wherever they go, it would happen to them when they were in rebellion to God. 
But they're going to come into submission to him, and in that time, we will see a great restoration. But the mountains will drip with sweet wine, right? And the hills will flow with milk, and the brooks of Judah will flow with water. Again, blessing will come instead of curse. A spring will go out from the house of the Lord to water the valley of Shittim. We, we read about some of this in Zechariah 14. Egypt will become a waste and Edom will become a desolate wilderness because of the violence done to the sons of Judah in whose land they have shed innocent blood. But Judah will be inhabited, everyone say forever, forever. and Jerusalem for all generations. And I will avenge the blood I have not avenged for the Lord dwells in Zion. So does the blood cry out? And does the Lord see all the bloodshed that has been done to Israel over the years? You know, uh, we went to the Colosseum and Rachel, drew, they just had a moment from the Lord there. And do you know what is crying out in that place? All the blood. You feel, I don't know, when I went in, I felt it. Right? That was not something that we went in from a historical standpoint. That's not some place I long to go. Okay? That, that's one of the most wicked places standing on the earth. Yet we say now it's a Catholic church. That's what they actually say. It's been turned into a, a church. Okay, and, and what happened in that place, we try to erase the history. We don't want to talk about it, but the blood that was spilled in that place, does God hear it? And he will destroy and he will bring judgment uh, for those things. So Matthew 24, the same thing. This is what this parable is about. It's in the context of the day of the Lord. Just to remind you, Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 go together. Okay, you can't separate them. All right, uh, it is a continuation of, of the, the Olivet Discourse. All right, Mark 13, Luke 21, they're by themselves. But then in Matthew 25, we get all these parables. We know about the virgins, right? And then the talents. And then we get into this one. And we have to get the context. What's the context? It's the day of the Lord. It's the culmination of the day of the Lord. He has come, and now he's going to render in the valley of decision judgment. So this is what the interpretation of this parable is. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him. So what's the context? When does this happen? When the Son of Man comes and all his holy ones with him. So is he coming to Zion? That's the context of this parable. Okay? He's not talking about some other time. He's talking about when he comes, when he comes with his angels. Then he will sit down on his glorious throne. Where is his glorious throne? Zion. That's right. Jerusalem. All the nations will be gathered before him. Did we just read that in Joel in chapter 3? And did we read it in Zechariah chapter 14? He will gather all the nations right before him. And he will separate them out one another as a shepherd separates out the sheep from the goats. Now there's interpretation and you go into Torah and you even look at Jacob and the different things. There's some stuff there, okay? And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right, come. You who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. Now, we know this will apply over the years. Like, okay, people take these parables, and they think of someone like Schindler, right? This is not necessarily about Schindler, okay? I don't believe this is in that time frame. Because Schindler, will he be brought up for white throne judgment unless he repented and turned to the Lord and is part of the bride? which I don't see that in history in part of his life, okay? But did God use him to rescue many Jews, okay? And does the Lord see that? And he will judge him according to that. But when is this time period? This time period is after the day of the Lord, the Lord then judges the nations. So these are those who are still in their flesh, who haven't had their flesh rot away from the judgment of God, and will he call the nations and render decisions with them based on how they treated Israel? So the ones who are alive in that time period, will there be another, we'll say, what we saw in, in Nazi Germany all of that time period, will there be people in the millennial reign who hide Jews? Think of, sorry, not before, not the millennial reign, excuse me, in the day of the Lord, who hide Jews, yes. who actually care for their fellow Jew, yes. okay? And will God see that? And now in that, of course, we will have some who will do that for believers, but it seems very clear that anyone who comes to believe in Messiah before the judgment that comes at the end of the age, they are martyred, it seems. I don't see them coming in. This is my, I and not the Lord. But the way I read it in Revelation, I don't see them coming in to the millennial reign. They seem to be killed. They die, but then they come alive, right? And they reign with Christ for a thousand years. But they're killed by the Antichrist, or his associates, we'll say. 
But this is those who have the nations cared for Israel. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. This is not about charity. This is not about humanitarian aid. That's not what this parable is about. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, right? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in naked and clothe you? When did uh, we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king, so who's going to answer? The king. In the valley of decision, Yahashaphat, right? The king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did to one of these, here's the key line, brothers of mine, even the least of them you did to me. Who are Jesus' brothers? The Jews, that's right. Now, is there an interpretation to this? Of course, we could say Christians because we have been brought in absolutely. But what's the intent of this parable? It's about the Hebrew people, is it not? And Jesus is saying at the end of the age, what is going to be the, th <laughs> the thing that is going to rip apart this world? Yes, it's the judgment of God, all the different things. But what is it going to be? It's going to be Jerusalem. It's going to be the Jewish people. And so then if you take the stand, let's just say, as a person, and say it's one of our relatives... And they really say, wait a minute, those things they were telling me are true, and my neighbor's a Jew, and they find out all the things that the local authorities are going to come and do to them. And they take them and they hide them away because they have faith in that moment and believe, will the Lord render them and bless them for that? Okay? So these are future parables. Of course, we can say throughout the ages how Israel has been treated by the goyim, by the nations. The Lord will take that into account as well. But we're talking about when the king comes, right, with his angels in all his glory, and he sits on his throne in Zion. That's a specific time, isn't it? And in the context of Matthew 25 is Matthew 24, the day of the Lord. Then the king will say to them, truly, right, you did this one of my brothers, of mine, even the least of them, you did it also to me. Now here's the other side. He will say to those on his left, so the goats, depart from you, you accursed one, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then... Uh, they themselves will answer, Lord, when did you see, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, same thing, right, and not care for you? And answer, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did, to, did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So is it very clear? So this is why in the true church of God do we need to talk about Israel. And we need to talk, what's that? No, absolutely not. It's, it's not about homeless. It's not about charity. It's not about any of that stuff. Now, as believers, do we need to do our due diligence in those things according to the scriptures? That's always my caveat in that. All right? I always have to say silly things, but just bear with me. That doesn't mean you see a homeless person on the street, you give them money. Never do that. I'm sorry. Do not do that. 99 out of 100 times, they will use that for alcohol, drugs, or sin. Okay? Do not give them money. If you're directed by God, you go up and you pray for them. Right? You can clothe them. You can feed them. You can do all of that. But what do you need to give them? You need to give them eternal food. Natural food is perishing. They will perish. Give them the eternal food. Okay? And then bring them into the church. Bring them into the family of God. Because usually those people, they're, they're so orphaned and so broken. What do they need? They need a family. And as they get the family, does the healing come? Yeah. And then God does a mighty work in their life. All right? Malachi chapter 4, for behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace. What day are we talking about? The day of the Lord. And all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff, and the day that is coming will be set ablaze. Our God is a consuming fire. And who says this? The Lord of armies. So that it will leave their, uh, them neither root nor branches, so everything will be consumed, but you, who fear my name, the son of righteousness, will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go forth and frolic like calves from the stall. Now again, there's so many pictures here in Isaiah and in the Psalms, and it's into that time period of the millennial reign. And you will crush the wicked underfoot, and they will be ashes under the soles of your feet in that day. And I, 
I am, a pre- I am preparing, excuse me, says the Lord of armies. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, and statutes and ordinances which I command you in Horeb for all Israel. So, of course, is this good for us? And should we abide in this? Absolutely. But who is he addressing this to? The people of Israel. And will they read these things? Will they cry out these things? Will they come into revelation of these things? And until that day comes, if we meet a Jew, if we are in these situations, can we tell them these things? Can we announce the things that are to come? And and it's so sad because we have to say it in kind of a blunt way here. As Paul says, the prophecies, the covenants, the blessings, all the things, the promises of God, who does it belong to? The Jewish people. And we've been grafted in. We've been brought in. And it's actually to put them to shame is what Paul says. Us Gentiles can interpret what was given to them. And that's supposed to bring a humbling, first of all, to us. Because we're supposed to not become arrogant. And where did we come from? We come from the root. Okay, we come from them. We remember our history. But then is it also to bring a humbling upon them that they might turn to God? That they might realize this mystery of the church, Jew and Gentile, has the interpretation to the prophecies that the Lord gave to them. Because we're not interpreting them. We, God has given us his Holy Spirit, and his Holy Spirit does it interpret it for us. And within us, we have revelation. So he continues on. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, the statutes of the ordinances which I commanded you, him at Horeb. For all Israel, behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So who's going to come? Do you believe this is literal? Anyone ever read through the, the Gospels? Did the Jews of that time think it was literal? No, they did. So we better believe it's literal too. And we have the two witnesses we know uh, in the book of Revelation. He will turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and strike the land with complete destruction. So there will be a restoration in that time and Elijah will have a a part in that. And again, this is about the Jewish people. But when will this happen? In the day of the Lord. Okay? So in the day of the Lord, will there be a revival that happens, we'll say, to the Jewish people? And they will turn back and will they accept the Messiah? Okay, now it's not all of them. It's a remnant, but this is the hope. This is the day we have coming in the future. All right, so bear with me in my train of thought here. Right now, you put up that slide, and we've talked about some of this stuff. I forgot I was going to put a picture of Putin in there, but I didn't. (laughs) And do we have lots of, yeah, players, absolutely. And do we have lots of wicked players? Okay, we have to call it for what it is, guys. Okay, are there evil men and women? Okay, now as long as today is called today, if they don't harden their hearts and they repent, can they turn? But does it reach a point where they don't want to turn? And just like Pharaoh, what did God do to Pharaoh? He hardened his heart and then he said, okay, if that's what you want, just as Paul talks about those who are made for common use and those who are made for dishonorable use. There's vessels of wrath. There's vessels, absolutely, things the Lord prepares for that. So forget all the players right here and all the things we have. This is a scripture the Lord spoke to me concerning these things. And again, we're talking about his judgment. We're talking about Israel. But also, as the church, should we be excited about the day of the Lord? Come on. Now, we don't plan to be here for the day of the Lord, but are you excited that the wickedness will be purged? That all the schemes of the devil and man will come to a head and the Lord will judge them? All right, we should say a loud amen to that. All right, we've been taught in the church you're not allowed to do that, right? We've been taught you need to pray for everybody and love everybody. But there's scriptures where the Lord says, stop praying for them because you're actually praying against the Lord's will. There's sins that he says, no, guys, you're not supposed to pray about that. That's evil. That's wrong. There's no intercession to be made. I've made a law. I've made a rule. And now they're in complete rebellion and you need to to let it go, right? So James chapter 5. All throughout the years, I would have always picked it up at beginning at verse 7. Because verse 7 is about the day of the Lord and the reign of the Messiah and the judge standing at the door and all these things. Well, the Lord, as I started this teaching, said, no, 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 back it up. And I had to remind myself of the own, my own lesson or the, same, the thing that uh, PJ, and I know Derek Prince said it all the time, when there's a therefore, you need to find out what it's there for. Well, I never noticed this therefore before. So we're going to start at the beginning of James chapter 5. 
Come now, you rich, and weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, their rust will be witness against you and consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days. What time period are we talking about? The last days. That you have stored up for yourselves treasure. All right, so let's just take one for an example. I'll leave the man with the Lord. He has to answer to the Lord. Bill Gates. Do you know he has profited over the last two years billions and trillions? Do you know he's bought up the most farmland in all of America in this time? Do you know all his companies and all the pharmaceuticals and all the things he's invested in, he's made trillions? Is that wicked and evil? If he really cares for people, why is that happening? It shows his heart, doesn't it? Now, again, Lord, keep our heart correct in these things. But do we have these verses for things like that? The reality that something that God used as a judgment, people don't repent. People don't turn back to God. What do they do? They say, how can I get rich off of it? Is that sick, actually, to think about? All right? So we need to then know the scriptures and what they say about it. He says, your gold, your silver, right? And it said, it will consume your flesh like fire. And in the last days, you have stored up, uh, the last days, you have stored up your treasures. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields. Now, this takes us back to Torah. So James seems to think this still applies. See, we've been taught, oh, no, 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 you just need to keep certain parts. That doesn't apply to us anymore. Well, James very clearly is saying, no, it applies. And does God see all the times we've cheated people? Do you know what the Lord says about unjust scales? Do you know what he says about robbery and usury and not paying your taxes? Uh, yeah, an awful lot. <laughs> it's everywhere. All right, and Jesus was the foremost preacher on this in the New Testament. And we have to remember James is a half-brother of Jesus, right? Who mowed your fields, which has been withheld by you, cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of... Yeah, the Lord of armies, that's right. Yahweh Zabayot. okay? And this is used two times, specifically in the New Testament. Paul also uses it in Romans chapter 9, talking about Israel and talking about the judgment that is to come and the reality of Israel. He says, you have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of want and pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. If we interpret, and we know James is a Hebrew, and what's his Bible? Yeah, the Tanakh, the Torah, that's right. So then what is he talking about when he says the day of slaughter? He's talking about the day of the Lord, and it's referenced into that way as well in the prophets. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Ooh. Who likes hearing that? That we are not to resist in that way. That's a hard verse, isn't it? That when the wicked and the rich and they come and oppress, what's the first thing that rises up in all of our hearts? Come on. What's the first thing? Anger. Very good. <laughs> Injustice. This is not right. And I will stand and I will fight. But what does the Lord say? He does not resist you. Now, again, this line is very important in context. Is there a time, there was a time for resisting. But what is the context of this verse? The day of the Lord. When are we not to resist the time that we're living in now? Because in this time, what's coming? Judgment. And the nations are on the rise, and the rich are on the rise, and the injustice is on the rise, and did the Lord warn us about it? And we're not to resist it in this time, because it's not going to be pushed back. All right, now it's going to be pushed back when the Messiah comes. We read all the prophecies on that. But right now, is it going to be pushed back in such a way like we saw in World War II? You get my point in that? And they're ushered in a new age of America the Great. Is that going to happen? No. It is going to, it's going to have its day. But that day is very short. And can we get a hallelujah for that? Its time period is very short. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the kings, and they get power for a very short time or only for an hour. It's a little while is what it says. Okay? Amen. But don't resist it because it's coming. Now, here's the therefore. So that was all about the rich and what they do, and they're storing up wrath, right? And the Lord of the Sabbath, he hears, Zabayot, he hears it all, right? And the day of slaughter. And then it says, therefore. So we talked about the rich, talked about the evil, talked about what they're going to be doing in this time. And he says, therefore, everyone say, be patient. <laughs> oh, it's the first time I saw it in context. And I said, no, Lord, I didn't want to read that. <laughs> 
Don't resist it. Be patient. The Lord said it's going to be this way. Brethren, until the coming of the Lord. So we need to be patient in this time because we know what's coming. The judgment. We know Yahweh Zabayot is he coming. And we want the judgment now. Okay? When we hear about wicked rulers and evil things, and now can God do that? He's God. And if he wants to raise up and tear down, he can do that. But are we going to see a queen sweep across the globe? Are we going to see, you know, elections overturned? Are we going to see Putin taken out? And we're going to get rid of Xi Jinping? And we're going to get rid of all these ungod ruler, ungodly rulers? And we're going to bring in an age of diplomacy. Is that going to happen? It's a delusion. That's right. And the vast majority of the church believes that. Okay? If you are a Catholic, you are a historicist or an all-millennialist. That is the doctrine you have to, to follow out. And what that says is, no, 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 the church will rise up and will push this back. Hence why the harlot, the religious system, all we're seeing, it's going to play right into all of that. All right? And unfortunately, we call it the Protestant side of the faith. But those who are not Catholic, what do we have? Yeah, dominionists, that's right. <laughs> Preterists, that's right. Okay? And they're saying the same thing is going to happen. You listen to the prophets all around the world, and what are they saying? America's going to rise again. We'll have another great awakening. We're going to push back. Trump's going to come back in. We're going to push back China. We're going to push back Russia. We're going to stop all this stuff from happening, and we're going to usher in a new age with cheap gasoline. <laughs> I'm not joking. It's funny, but I'm not joking. It's the truth. Yeah, petrol profits, right? <laughs> All right, the farmer, so here's then he gives us a, a, a little parable or analogy. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it. What's happening right now? We could connect this in, of course, what Jesus talked about. We read about the reapers, the angels, right, that go out. And we know Jesus gave us a parable on this. And what does he say? Be patient. What's growing right now? The wheat and the tares. Well, how do you know a wheat from a tear? You have to let them grow, and how do you tell the difference? When they show their face, their heads, right? You get my point in that. They show their face, and right now, what's happening? God is showing the faces. God is showing who's a tear and who's a wheat. And as we see that separation, we need to be patient until it gets the early and the late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. So how do you strengthen your heart? By proclaiming the coming of the Lord is near. And you keep speaking that. You keep proclaiming the truth. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves might not be judged. So what is he actually saying? In the midst of all the wicked, all the evil, all these rulers and rich who are doing evil things, he's then warning us, you don't do that. You don't complain against your brother. You don't come against them in the way, because, come on, guys, just a simple analogy the bully in school bullies the little kid. Nine times out of ten, what does the little kid then go on to do? Be a bully. That's right. He says, now I'm going to find, he's still getting picked on. He's still getting beat up. But what does he find? He finds somebody else that he can belittle. So the Lord is warning us through James here, when we feel that bullying from the powers that be, what do we need to make sure we don't do? Bully yeah, bully our brothers. That's right. And we try to appease that thing, and we have to say, no, wait a minute, I can't do that. I need to love, I need to forgive, I need to let go, because just as the Yahweh Zabayot is watching them, he's also watching me. And if I become a bully, just like it says in the, the parable uh, of the servants, the bond servants in the house, Jesus said there was the man, right, the, the foolish one, who's not prepared for the, the coming of the Messiah, says there's a long way off, and what's he start to do? He starts to bully his fellow servants. Do you know there's lots of bullying going on in the house of God? And it's not right. Yeah, making money off of them, abusing them, getting drunk, but trying to control people, trying to look down on people, trying to, to speak maliciously against somebody. It ought not be that way in the household of God. So he says, do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing where? Right at the door. As an example, brethren. So what's the example? Of suffering and patience. He didn't just say patience. <laughs> he said suffering. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So when we're patient in these things, just as we are seeing here, the rich come against you, hardship happens, right? Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Name me a prosperity prophet in the Hebrew Scriptures. Find me one, please. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, okay. Did they have very hard lives? And is he saying, read them, know them, follow their example, right? We count those blessed who endure. Do you feel that way? Are you blessed when these things come upon you? Are you blessed when we're cheated? Are we blessed when all these... No, we don't think that way. So we need to change our view, right? Blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job, not that fella, and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealing that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Can we get an amen? amen. That's our God. All right, we'll end there. I wanted to go into a little bit on the millennial reign, but that will be for a later day. <laughs> Part eight, you know, we'll, we'll end at part seven and we'll start the millennial reign all over because <laughs> I'm really getting a lot more revelation on that reading through the scriptures. Because again, as yeah, and I'll, Rachel can come in between, I'll, I'll, I'll let her go. <laughs> all right, no, but in that, the reality of all of this, guys, do we know where it's leading? So, can we actually have great confidence? Right, don't throw it away, guys, don't throw away your confidence. The scriptures say that because we very clearly. Can we be shaken from our composure? And the enemy wants you to throw away your confidence, right? What's, what was the attack during COVID? When you started to say, well, no, this is a judgment of God, you started to say, these things are not right. You called out the things that were unbiblical. Were you attacked? And what was it trying, what is the enemy trying to do? Shake you from your composure or your soundness of mind. He's trying to get in that place and take away your confidence. Because do we have confidence, guys? Do we know the end from the beginning? Has he revealed it to us? Has anyone noticed, especially now, the days we live in? Can we literally open the Bible? I'm not saying you should be opening the papers or be in the news all the time because a lot of it is just rubbish now. And depending on your source, you could be really hurt by that. But if you open it up and follow the true narrative, are you going to follow what is in the Word of God? The papers are the same as the Word of God, aren't they? The news that we're going through and the wars and rumors of wars, the calamity, the birth pangs, all the stuff. Is it what God said would happen at the end of the age? So then are we encouraged? Because what does that mean? This generation, this, that specific generation will not pass away until, that's right, until it's all fulfilled. All right? So we will see it happen in our time. Let's stand up. We'll end with this. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend, ascend excuse me, onto the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? This isn't just David talking about back then. We're talking about the millennial reign. One who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to deceit and has not sworn deceitfully. He will receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Even Jacob, Selah, lift up your heads. Oh, you gates. Oh, gates. Remember we read it in Zechariah 14? The gates and the king's gate and the quarters. This is about that time period. Lift up your gates, O oh, ancient doors, right? That the king of glory may come in. So where is he coming to? Zion, Jerusalem. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of armies. He is the king of glory. Selah. Amen. Yeah, come on. Let out the shout. Woo! Thank you, Lord. We can let out the victory shout because we know our God's plan. So, Lord, we thank you. The Lord of armies, the King of glory, you are coming. And we just pray we would settle this in our hearts. And if there's anything, Lord Jesus, that would come in and try to get us off this, may we not be shaken from our steadfastness, our composure, our solid mind, Lord God, in you. And may we put on that helmet of deliverance, salvation. And when the enemy tries to come and say, no, it's not going to happen this way, or don't believe, can you truly trust him just as he came and he deceived Eve in the garden and lied about your character and who you are? Lord, may those things fall on our deaf ears. We rebuke you, Satan. We say, go. We want nothing to do with the lies of the enemy and the ways, Lord God, that he would come in and try to deceive our minds. So we just pray today that you would encourage each one of us.
We pray today, Lord God, that the truth we just heard in the scriptures and about your coming and about all the things that will happen at the end of the age, may we write them on our heart, Lord, engrave them on our heart, engrave them on our mind. May they be part of our every being. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that the day is coming where you will come over the mountain. You will descend the Mount of Olives. You will go down through the valley over those graves that they've put there to try to stop you. And you will come in the gate called Beautiful. You will enter your holy city. And we thank you, Jesus, for that great and glorious day. And we thank you for the plans and the hope you have for your people, Israel. And may we see these things correctly in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.